All right, good morning. Good, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here this morning, here in the building. We're also glad that you're joining us through our Facebook live streaming service. So welcome our guests as well. And thank you for being here this morning. We have a few announcements here before we get started. Norman and Tanya Hale are excited to announce the birth of a new grandson, Joseph Fisher, born July 6 to Jacob and Molly Hale. So we're excited about a, a new birth. Lisa Proctor, who is sitting here on, at the back corner here, was baptized last week. So we rejoice in your decision, Lisa. Thank you for your decision to commit to Christ. All right, so I want to remind each of us to stay in touch through our social media since we're not communicating as much as we normally would in a lot of uh, gatherings. Please uh, stay in touch through our Facebook and uh, our website for announcements and other information that we need to get in touch with each other. All right, I guess everybody knows the last few days that summertime is here. <laughs> it is uh, hot and humid, but... One of the products of that is everything is lush and the flowers are blooming, so there's some beautiful things that are happening right now. I know our crepe myrtle are starting to bloom and some other flowers, so um, even though there's a little heat, there's a lot of things that are growing and benefiting from this summertime. All right, let's read from Psalms 102 before we start singing together. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Good morning. Let's join in song together. Light of the world. Morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for everything that you've given us today. Thank you for this opportunity to gather 
here physically and online through our Facebook online service. Protect our health as we're here today with the virus that's going around. Help us to be able to stay healthy through all of this. Help us prepare our minds for what we're going to learn today and what we're going to sing today. In Jesus' name, amen. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only peace is you. My When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are told in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, to examine our lives. And in John, 1 John 1, 7 through 10, it says, or, well, we'll just read 8 through 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will not forgive us and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. From 1740 to 1786, the king of Prussia, which later became part of Germany, was Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great. Once during his reign, Frederick went to a prison to examine it and to meet some of the prisoners there. Upon walking in, he was easily recognized by the prisoners, and almost all of them began to proclaim their innocence to him and insist that he, they deserved to be pardoned. However, off by himself, one prisoner who was saying nothing, was saying nothing, Frederick approached him and asked him why he was incarcerated. The man replied that he was in for armed robbery. Frederick followed up by asking whether he was guilty or not. The man said, yes, indeed, he was guilty. Upon hearing this, Frederick went to one of the guards and said to him, release this man. I don't want him to corrupt all these innocent men. <laughs> so the one man who admitted his sin was the one who was forgiven by the king and given his freedom. We are all familiar with Jesus' story of the Pharisee and the publican. It was the publican who acknowledged that he was a sinner and went home forgiven. I'm sure that all of us here also acknowledge that we are sinners. But we tr do we truly sorrow over our sin and grieve that it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross? 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, after Jesus had prayed fervently for his disciples and for all Christians, he and his disciples were confronted by Judas and a great crowd, including the chief priests and elders. When they seized Jesus, Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Rather than praising Peter for his swift and bold action, Jesus rebuked him and restored the man's ear. Jesus was next brought to the home of the high priest, where he was asked whether he was the son of God, to which Jesus answered affirmatively. So he was accused of blasphemy. You might think that the high priest would be a little lenient on Jesus after what Jesus has done for his servant, but lots of times even kindness can't soften a heart that is hardened. Next, Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate. Pilate asked him a few questions, and Jesus answered them very succinctly. His terseness in both these situations pretty much fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah 53 that says, like a sheep that before its shearer is silent, so he opened out not his mouth. So why did Jesus not give a long speech that would provide proof that he actually was the Son of God, or even do some miracle to provide even stronger proof? Because of my sin, and because he loves me. After Pilate washed his hands of the situation, Jesus was scourged. You may not be familiar with what exactly a scourging entailed, but often the victim's back was almost destroyed, with some of them dying right then and there, even before the crucifixion. Jesus was also cruelly mocked and spit upon and had a crown of thorns forced down upon his head. He then had the cross loaded on his back and commanded to carry it to Mount Calvary. Calvary. Having lost so much blood already and being greatly weakened, Jesus could not carry the cross the entire way, so Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry it for him. So why did Jesus endure all this suffering and humiliation when he could easily have stopped it by performing some miracle to protect himself, perhaps calling a legion of angels. He didn't do so because of my sin and because he loves me. When they arrived at Mount Calvary, Roman soldiers hammering large nails or spikes through his wrists and feet. Just imagining someone doing that to me causes me to tremble and possibly faint. Then the soldiers raised the cross and planted it in the ground. Jesus hung there for six hours, struggling for his very breath all the while being mocked some more, with several of the people telling him to save himself if he truly was the Son of God. So why didn't he do so? Saving himself and proving that he was right and his critics were wrong. Because of my sin and because he loves me. While on the cross, it was not just the Roman soldiers in the crowd who mocked him. One of the criminals hanging there beside him did so also. However, the other criminal said that Jesus was innocent, unlike himself, and he asked Jesus to remember him when he would come into his kingdom. Jesus replied by saying that the mad when, man would that day be with himself in paradise. So why, despite this man's horrible crimes, did Jesus forgive him at this last minute, so to speak? Because he loved him. He also loved the unrepentant criminal. And he loves you, and he loves me. David wrote in Psalm 51 that his sin was ever before him, and our sin is ever before us also. I must continually remind myself that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. I can't minimize the effect my sin had or soften the blow, so to speak, by saying to myself, it was my sin and your sin, or it was my sin and everybody else's sin. No, I must concentrate only on my sin. I am the guilty one, and I should be sentenced to hang on the cross. Praise God that he has had mercy on me. So as we take of the Lord's Supper, I pray that each one of us would meditate on our own role in Jesus' crucifixion and then thank him for his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's pray. To God, we thank you so much that you have had mercy on us, that Jesus suffered on the cross in our place, and pray that we would grieve over our sin and that we would, with the help of your Spirit, strive to be more like Jesus every day in order that we might please you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Pray for the fruit of the vine. Everybody. Yeah. Um, dear God, we thank you so much that you have had Jesus on the cross, shed his blood, that our sins might be forgiven. We sing, there's power in the blood. There truly is. We pray that we would 
think on that and think on the sacrifice that Jesus made as we partake of this right now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mark 12, verses 41 through 44, says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came in and came in, put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Imagine the poor widow approaching the temple. She comes to the door and sees these, all these rich people in there. She may have thought, maybe I sh shouldn't go in. I'll just be in the way, and I'm not giving much money anyway. However, she works up her courage and proceeds toward the offering box. On the way there, she may have got bumped some and elbowed by the rich people as they waved their arms trying to draw attention to themselves. Most of the pro rich probably didn't even notice her as she slinks toward the box. And those who see her put her coins in the box may have thought, wow, she gave almost nothing. God certainly loves me a lot more than he does her because I gave so much. That's probably why he blessed me with so much money, showing an attitude similar to the Pharisee who looked down on the publican. These rich people's thoughts about their contributions were all about how much they would impress both everyone else and who was there and also those whom they would later boast about to, uh, boast to about their generosity. Meanwhile, the poor widow, as she proceeds out of the temple, is thinking, oh God, I thank you so much for the way you have blessed me that I might be able to give back to you some of it. I pray that it will be used to help others who are hurting e either spiritually or physically. With an attitude like that, it is no wonder that Jesus commended her and that her generosity is spoken of to this day. I hope and pray that each one of us would be willing to sacrifice our finances and possessions in like manner as she did so that God's work can be accomplished in this town and throughout the world. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are rich beyond our imagination and uh, with physical possessions, but mostly we can look forward to a home in heaven with you and the spiritual possessions we have now and, and will have in heaven. Pray that we would be eager to give back to you of all that you have provided to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sweet. 
Scripture reading this morning will come from uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, story about uh, Jesus healing the paralytic man. Chapter 2 of Mark, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus had come to come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic cared by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up immediately, picked up the pallet, and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. Thank you, Eddie. Good morning. Am I on? All right. I'm green. Okay. All right. There we go. I'll just stay here then. Good morning. Thank you for being here. And I know we have many, many more online, and we're thankful for your presence in this service as well. And keep commenting. Let us know that you're involved, but we're thankful for everyone in the auditorium and those who are online, and we uh, hope you have a a good week. I've been listening to an audio book by a neuroscientist. He's also a best-selling author. He's written several books. His name is Daniel Levitin. And the book that I'm listening to is called The Organized Mind, Thinking Straight in the Age of Information Overload. And in the book, he interviews many entertainment people, business people, politicians, athletes. He talks to them to learn how their brain operates, how it's organized in a way that makes them more successful. And so he's writing this book, and he lists a number of ways that you can help organize your brain. You might find it interesting to know that one thing you can do to keep your brain organized is to write things down. I I do this all the time. Maybe you don't want to multitask as many things times in all the ways that we do. And then he lists a bunch of other things. But under a chapter about social media and this information overload, he tells the story that back in 2009, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, known as DARPA, did an experiment. Now, they're underneath, this organization is underneath the uh, Department of Defense, and they were doing an experiment to see how quickly the public at large could help the government to locate or to identify some danger or some threat, something or someone that would be a threat to our nation. They wanted to see how quickly the public could help them identify the threat. So they placed 10 large weather balloons in full sight, but 10 locations all around our nation. Then they offered $40,000 to the individual or the team who could locate all 10 balloons and give them the location of all 10. How quickly could that happen? Well, there were 53 teams, 4,300 individuals that entered the contest, and the winning group was from MIT. 
They located all 10 balloons using social media. They set up a Facebook page. They set up a Twitter account. And they located all 10 weather balloons in just under nine hours. And they offered $4,000 balloon to any individual or people who could help them locate one of them. So it took only nine hours for them to locate all 10 balloons that were scattered all over our nation, proving the effectiveness of networking and social media and your friend who is my friend who is another guy's friend. It worked. I wonder, using this example, my question is, what if the church... What if all of us as disciples of Jesus Christ, if we had that same kind of passion to go out and to seek, to find those who are lost in their sins and to bring them to Jesus Christ? What if we could use all of our networking, my friend who's a friend of your friend who's a friend of their friend, and what if we could all be organized together, united together in this mission of seeking out the lost and bringing them to Jesus if we were all working together as a team, as a church? How successful could we be? Could it be so successful that the Lord could once again be adding to their numbers daily? It could happen. We're going to look in Mark chapter 2. It's a familiar story. It's the story, as Eddie read to us, about the man who was a paralytic. Normally, we look at this story and we look at Jesus' authority not only to heal, but also to forgive sins. I want to look at this story from a completely different angle than what we normally, how we look, normally look at it. And there's a parallel passage in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 and following. They're almost identical. But it's the story of Jesus. He's in Capernaum, and there are some friends who bring to the house where Jesus is teaching a man who is paralyzed. He's a friend of theirs, but they are not able to get into the house because it is far too crowded. So they climb up on the roof, and they begin to dig out the roof in order to hoist or lower, lower their friend down into the house. And we begin to think, first thing we think about is, what about that roof? I mean, they just dug a hole in the middle of someone's roof. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not take too kindly if some people came over, even if they had a very good reason, just began digging a hole in my roof large enough to lower a man's body down through. Now, this may not be quite as outrageous as we first think it is because it's not as destructive as it would be in our day and time using our roof. Palestinian houses back in the first century were flat roofs. And on that roof were some cross beams, and then they would lay reeds and tree branches, and then they would cover it with mud. So it didn't require power tools. It did not require a jackhammer in order to pound your way through a roof. It was actually quite easy and quite simple to dig through a Palestinian house. Now, I don't want to minimize the extra effort of their friends. These friends literally went the extra mile. They went well and above what normal friends would do for another friend. They climbed up on a roof in order to dig a hole in it to lower their friend down to Jesus. I don't want to minimize their efforts, but as far as physical strength, as far as what it took, it's, it's not, it wasn't very difficult. And this is in the city of Capernaum. This is Peter's hometown. Oftentimes, when Jesus was in Capernaum, he might use Peter's house as sort of a headquarters. There is a strong possibility that this house belongs to Peter. And Peter understood that, that this was necessary for this man to get access to Jesus. So it may not be as an outrageous of a thing as we think of it. But what about those friends? 
We have no idea, at least not in this story, we have no idea of knowing how far they carried their friend on this pallet or on this stretcher to Jesus. Was it a quarter of a mile, half a mile, two miles? We don't know, but it was quite an effort to bring them. Now, they could have easily carried him a, a long distance and getting to the house, seeing how crowded it was, they could have easily rationalized, hey, buddy, the house is crowded. No one's giving way. We're not able to get inside. I don't know what to tell you, except let's try again tomorrow. Let's go home. But they don't do that. They want their friend to see Jesus. They believe that Jesus can heal their friend. Some commentary suggests that while there may be a ladder or steps that go up to the roof of this house, oftentimes that, that ladder was not available to people because it also gave robbers access to the roof. So it's possible they may have gone next door, gone through the house next door up to that roof and then jumped over to this. We don't know how they did it. All we know is that it appears they would not stop. They persisted. They would not be deterred until their friend was at the feet of Jesus to be healed of his paralysis. Now, here's some lessons. Now, we deal with that a lot in most of our sermons. But here are some other lessons I want us to learn from this story. And I believe they are just as important. There are only two groups of people mentioned in this story. There are those who hindered the sick, needy man from getting to Jesus, and then there are those who helped him get to Jesus. That's the only two groups. There are those people who are literally in the way of someone coming to Jesus. They prevent him and they hinder him from coming to Jesus. There are those who are in the way, and then there are those who make a way. Only two groups. Now, if you're like me, you are, you're a little bit uncomfortable that there's only two groups of people in this story. It's those that help someone come to Jesus and those who hinder someone coming to Jesus. You see, I want a third group, don't you? I may not be in the people who are a group of people bringing people to Jesus, but I don't really classify myself as being someone who's in the way of someone coming to Jesus. I would rather have a third group of the passive group. I'm not really instrumental, but I'm not preventing people. I'm just sort of neutral. Well, that would be nice, except the story doesn't mention that group. The story doesn't go that way. There's only two groups, those who hinder and those who help. Those who hindered the man from getting to Jesus, I don't believe they woke up that morning intending to be that. I don't think they sent out text messages and got on their Twitter accounts and started saying, hey, everybody, let's go and load up this house full of people so that that man who is paralyzed can't even get into the house and they'll, they'll just have to carry him home. I don't think that happened. I don't think most people think that way. So I don't think it's something intentional. Plus, I don't believe that these people are necessarily immoral people. You know, we can hinder people from coming to Jesus just by, by, our, by our sinful lifestyle and by our bad attitudes, maybe grumpiness, grumpiness and griping and things. People say, well, you know, if that's the way Christians are, I don't want to live like that. I look at them and they're, they're as worldly as I am. It is possible that our worldliness can keep someone from Jesus. Yes, but that's not in this story. These people are not immoral people. They don't seem to have bad attitudes. They're just in the way. They are in the house for a very good reason. They want to listen to Jesus, just like you have come today to listen to the Word of God, to hear this story about Jesus. They want to listen to Jesus. They want to hear him speak, and they want to hear the teaching of Jesus. The reason that they are hindering this man is because they are in the way, yes, but the real reason is they're only thinking 
of themselves. They're there for a good reason. They want to hear the words of Jesus. And it could be that this crowded house is stymieing this person from coming to Jesus because no one will give way to another person. I'm here. I got here early enough to get this place in this house, and I am not budging. Hey, but we got a sick friend. We need in. Well, sorry, buddy. We were here first. Sometimes it is possible to come to worship, to sing, to pray, to hear a message, and still only think of ourselves, especially when it comes to my place in my pew. Have you ever said that to anyone? Have you ever said to someone, you're sitting in my pew? place? Because if you do, if you have, you're thinking only of yourself. We don't think often enough about, oh, hey, I am so happy to see you. Here, let me scoot in. I want you to sit by me. Please sit by me because it would give me the opportunity to know you even better. Come, sit by me and worship. I know we're in a very unusual make a setup right now with our social distancing but even still we can learn to be friendly and accommodating we can be inviting we can have the greatest attitude so that even when we are six feet apart from other people we can still help people come and worship the lord learn more about him and to have access to jesus and if there's someone here who is in need it just might be your encouragement or your friendliness, or your compassion that will make them take the next step to have their need met by Jesus. We can come even into a place like this with really good reasons for being here and still think only about ourselves and what we want and our place in this assembly. That's how you hinder someone. But then there's that group of people who actually were proactive in helping this man come to Jesus. We need to be that kind of a church. We need to be a disciple-making church that is sensitive and aware of all of the people who are around us, not just in our assembly, but in our place of work, across the street, down the road, and some of those common acquaintances that we bump into from time to time. We need to be people, not a church. That comes when all of us take the responsibility individually. We need to become individuals who are friendly and inviting, who serve one another, who are encouraging to others. And we are always on the lookout for someone who needs Jesus. And they need to come to Jesus. Jesus provides a very perfect example of this when Paul writes to the church in Philippi, In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Now, he's writing to individuals just like you. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility. Listen to it. Count others more important, more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Think about others before you think about yourself. Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, something to cling to, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And if Jesus were thinking only about himself, he could have said to those angels, I'm not going to heaven, uh, leaving heaven to go down to earth. I'm not going to scoot over from my place in my pew and all the splendor and wonder of heaven. I'm not going to go down there and become one of them. But you see, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking about me. He was thinking about you. And people, 
individuals who are, who are effective in bringing people to Jesus. They're effective in making disciples and winning souls. They are those who do not think about themselves. They think about others first. And they're not controlled, and they're not consumed by their own schedules. And they, they don't think like this. They don't think, well, I'd like to help David. I'd like to help somebody, but it's not convenient right now. I've got too much to do. I've got too many places to go. There's too many things on my calendar. They're not controlled by their calendar and their schedule. If there's someone who is in need, they think about that person first. And they get in there, and they do whatever is necessary, and they help. And churches who are successful at bringing people to the master... They are churches where the members have in their DNA the spirit of humility, the desire to help and to serve, to encourage, to scoot over and to make room. They don't sit on the end of a pew and make every other person crawl over them so that they can worship and sing. Though they get in the middle and they make it easy for people to be in the presence of Jesus. That's what people who help do. So I ask the question, who are you presently helping to bring to Jesus? Now that is not a rhetorical question. It's a real question that you and I must answer. Who right now are you presently encouraging someone to find Jesus? Who is that one person at least that you are encouraging and inviting to come and be a part of a worship service with you, to attend a home study group or a small group? Who is that one person that you're inviting to, to get together and let's study the scriptures together? Who is at least that one person that you are praying for? Or more especially, they have a need, you're helping them in their need, and you take the opportunity to pray with them concerning their need. Who is that person you're inviting, encouraging, serving, praying with? And if no name comes to mind, then I wonder just how serious are we about being disciples of Jesus Christ? I wonder how quickly we can be used as an entire church. How quickly can the Lord depend on us to go out and seek the lost, to locate them, and to bring them to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. Now, you may be saying, well, I'd, I'd like to do that. I want to do that, but I'm not comfortable inviting someone to come to church. I don't know the right words. And I'm certainly not comfortable sitting down and conducting a Bible study with someone. It's not my gift. And besides that, what if they ask me a question that I cannot answer? What kind of a predicament is that going to put me in? See who you're thinking about? When you're thinking about your schedule and your convenience and whether or not it's your gift, you're not thinking about them, you're thinking about you. But what if they ask me a question I cannot answer? Folks, the world does not need for you to be a walking, talking Bible scholar. They need you to be loving and friendly, accommodating. They need you to be willing to help and to serve. They need to know at times that you are praying for them. And you may just find an individual who wants to know the same Savior who's made such a difference in your life. You know, that's how the Apostle Paul lived his life. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 23. Paul says, if I, if I just think about myself, I'm free from all, all responsibilities. I don't really have any really big responsibilities to anyone or anything for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though 
not my, being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Why? That I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I became all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Have you ever met someone that became all things to all people? Have you ever met someone that just tries to be what that person needs you to be? About 14 years ago when we moved to this congregation, we were it really literally it was the first week that my family and I were here in Searcy, Arkansas. And school was about to start. And Natalie, our youngest daughter, had a problem. She had an ingrown toenail. And she's about to go to school, and that was really going to cause great problems and some pain for her. So we immediately began to look for someone that, that might be able to take care of this ingrown toenail. Now, mind you, I don't know you. I didn't know you then as well as I know you now. I only knew a few of you who were actual doctors. And one of them lived just a few blocks from our house, Kyle Blickenstaff. I just knew he was a doctor. And he lived very close. So I looked up his number, the office number. I called and they made an appointment. They checked with Dr. Blickenstaff. It's hard for me to call some of you doctor because you, you become friends of mine. And so he's just Kyle to me. But, but I looked up the number. They said, yeah, he says come at the end of the day and he'll see Natalie. And so Natalie and I go about 5 o'clock and we go at the end of the day. We don't have to wait very long. And pretty soon they escort us to a room and Kyle Blickenstaff comes in and he, he kind of asks a few questions. He looks at the toe, and then he numbs it up, and he snips off a part of that toenail that's causing the problem and didn't take very long, and all of a sudden, the problem is solved. He wraps her toe up and, and uh, sends us on our way. And we were very, very grateful that there was someone who could meet that need in our life. I don't know how many days later, a few days or maybe next week, I was talking to Kyle's father-in-law, Doc City. And, and we mentioned, or he learned somehow, that Kyle had taken care of Natalie's ingrown toenail. And Doc City said, oh, next time you have something like that, come see me. Kyle is an orthopedic surgeon. Talk about your little bit of over... Yes, he was overqualified for dealing with the ingrown toenail, yes. But you know, that has become one of my fondest memories... Because here was an orthopedic surgeon who knew we didn't need an orthopedic surgeon. We needed an ingrown toenail surgeon. And he became what we needed him to be. He could have easily said, listen, I don't do that kind of procedure in my office. Let me give you the name of a doctor who does. No. He never said anything except, I'm glad to help. And I consider him a good friend because of that. Do we really want to feel comfortable inviting someone to study and worship with us to become a part of our church family? Then look for someone who has a need. Look for someone who you know is in need. And then you help them. Serve them. Pray with them encourage them whatever they need you to be in their life at that moment you become all things to all men and you will find people along the way who will want to know jesus the way you do now are you going to be successful every single time probably not but you just might save some Maybe you have a need this morning. We want to help meet your need, whether it's a spiritual need, whether it's a relational need, a financial need. If there's something that, is, that you need God's help in, you need us to pray with you and serve you, there's a number on the screen. You can call that. I'll be close to that number for an hour after this service. 
And if there's a need that you can have, I promise I will not pray for you. I will pray with you on the phone. So if you have a need, please call that number. And in just a moment, we're going to sing a song in a moment Then David is going to come and lead our shepherd's prayer. Ryan, thank you for the excellent job that you are doing today leading our worship service. And so let's sing this together. And it's, it's kind of a mission statement of ours when we think about this song that we're about to sing. And so when you sing it, I hope that as you sing this song, there is someone in your life, someone in your sphere of influence, that you know you ought to take a step in helping to bring them to Jesus. Let's think about that person while we sing. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, May we choose to help and not hinder those coming to Jesus. When I was uh, uh, in high school, I ran track. And I, was, I ran all three relays. And I was an anchor person, the one on the end. I didn't start well. I didn't run well throughout, but I could finish well. Maybe that's the way we are sometimes. We need to find our link in the chain to bring people home. We in, at College Church have so many things here that we bless people with. When you first come to become a, a, a member here, you will be given uh, a list of those different ministries and you get to decide Where's my strength? How can I serve? I work in carrying and sharing. They don't want me in the kitchen. <laughs> what can I say? Neither does my wife most of the time either. So, But there's an interconnectedness of the church's different ministries. And 
there's an intentionality that you have to bring. I'm going to give you four eyes. Interconnectedness, intentionality, individual responsibility. We don't have a choice. We've been given these talents, and we have a responsibility to use them. Many of you in here do different things for those different ministries. Some, t some of you think it's so small, but it's not. Without that, the chain's broken. The relay stops. We don't reach those. And the last one is involvement. Interconnectedness, intentionality, individual responsibility, and involvement. Let's do all we can, whether it's carrying someone to the top of the roof or lowering, lowering them down. Let's do our part, no matter where we're at, and God will be pleased. We will be blessed, and others will come to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we cannot but praise you. We cannot but take you on and share with the world because you've given us so, so much. Father, help us to be used in your kingdom. May we choose to help and not hinder those coming to Jesus. May we do our part, whether it be prison ministry, caring and sharing, disciple making. The list is so long in that. Uh, there are other areas Help us to find our, our niche that we have, but help us to be intentional in bringing others to you. Forgive us of sin. Use us in your kingdom. Bless us in our work that we've, we have before us. Thank you for the message today from Noel. And Father, may we always follow the example of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.